I would like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dan Zur. Dan Zur joined UW Extension in June 2008. Prior to that, he worked as an environmental scientist in the watershed management section of the Kansas Department of Health and Environment in Topeka and taught environmental and physical science at Friends University in Topeka. He was a research associate for the Center for Agricultural Resources and Environmental Systems at the University of Missouri, Columbia. He also worked in radio broadcasting for many years in South Dakota. Dan has a BS in biology from Northern State University in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and an MS in environmental science from Indiana University. He's a regional natural resources educator and involved with the Red Cedar Watershed Rain to Rivers program and conducts various natural resources webinars. Thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I know it's the you know the last afternoon session. I was, I, I was guessing five. Five was my guess, and you guys have outdone my guess. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, as Alana said, I'm, I'm with UW Extension. Um, I'm a natural resource educator. There, there used to be when I started this job 11 years ago. There was, um, trying to remember, there was 15 of us around the state, and we're down to eight now. Uh, budget cuts and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, we're not quite as regional as we used to be. I, I do uh, uh, things beyond the, the area of Eau Claire uh, where I live, but, uh, but still work primarily a lot in the Eau Claire area with, uh, with the Chippewa River, the Eau Claire River, uh, the Red Cedar River, and, and all of the lakes around um, seven or eight counties in that part of the state. Um, so what I'm going to talk uh, to you about today is just kind of some basics on watershed watershed science, and, and not even so much science. I don't want, this is not gonna be a, so much a geeky conversation as it is uh, just kind of a common sense conversation about, about what watersheds are all about. Um, just, I just wanna throw some interesting facts about water. Can it, everybody can hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna th just throw some interesting facts about water uh, out to you. Um, water is, is one of the few substances that's found on Earth naturally in all three states, gas, liquid, and solid. There aren't very many other substances on the planet that you can find naturally. I mean, you can, you know, you can take lead and boil it and, and melt it down into molten lead, but it, it, molten lead doesn't exist naturally in too many places other than maybe some volcanoes. Um, so that's a very interesting thing about water. Uh, frozen water is less dense than liquid water, which is not normal. Again, let's, let's use lead as an example. Lead is a metal. If you, if you, if you make some molten lead, if you melt lead down, and then you take a, a hunk of solid lead and you drop it in, where does that hunk of solid lead go? It goes to the bottom. Most everything does that. In its solid form, it's more dense. Water's the opposite. Water is less dense in its solid form because of the crystallization. It expands, it, gets, it takes up more space with less weight um, when, it, when it freezes. And if you think about that, if water behaved like everything else, our lakes would freeze from the bottom up, right? How weird would that be? We wouldn't have any fish in our lakes because in the wintertime, they would freeze from the bottom up and kill everything. So that's a very interesting uh, quality about water. Um, uh, another thing, water molecules are slightly polar. So you see the kind of Mickey Mouse ears shape of the water molecule there with the, with the hydrogen atoms and, and the uh, one oxygen atom. Hydrogen atoms are a little bit uh, positive. The oxygen atom is a little bit negative. So it's slightly polar. It has a little bit of a charge on one end and because of that, it can dissolve a lot of substances. It, it pulls different substances into the fluid because it's slightly polar. It's got a little bit of, a, of an attraction to it. And um, cohesion and adhesion, if you, if you drop a drop of water on a countertop, it doesn't spread out into a thin little layer, right? It stays in a little bead. The, those water molecules want to stay together because they're slightly polar. And all these things are important in how water behaves in nature and, and how water behaves in, in, in living organisms too. And, and adhesion is another very important uh, element of water. Adhesion is the, the, the desire for water to grab onto other things or attract other things. So if you, if you take a capillary tube, a thin little tube, and you drop water in it, you'll see that the, the drop of the water has a U-shape, right? It's kind of grabbing the sides. You can kind of see that in a glass of water too. The water's kind of grabbing the sides of the glass. And that's very important because water will, will pull things toward it. If you have a planter, let's say you have a, a rectangular planter with, with some plants in it, right? And the soil's dry. You dump water in one end, what's gonna happen after a while? All of that soil is gonna get wet, right? The water's not gonna stay right where you dropped it. The water is going to move through that whole soil. It's going to 
move toward the stuff that's dry because again, it's looking for those pores and it's looking for things to attract itself to. So water has some very interesting properties and, and all of those properties are, are, are very important in many ways. We are about 70% water and we come from water. Evolutionarily, you know, there, was, there were no land critters on earth at one time, everything was in the water. So we evolved from water critters and we still are very much mostly water. Um, humans can go nearly a month without food, but we can't go more than a few days without water. We need water. Water is very, very important to us, um, and, uh, and we need it pretty much every day. Um, this surprises a lot of people. Of the fresh water that we use globally, 70% of it goes to agriculture, 20% goes to industrial purposes, and only 10% goes to municipal uses. We're using most of our water, most of our fresh water is being used for, uh, for agriculture, to water crops, to feed animals, uh, to clean machinery, all the stuff that, that happens in the agriculture sector. So we all need water and, and we, we seem to need lots of it. This is a nifty little graph. So, so basically what we're looking at here is, is this is all the water in the world and 97.5% of it is trapped in the oceans. And only two and a half percent of the world's water is fresh water. So this is a little sliver up here. So if we, if, if we expand that little sliver out into all the fresh water in the world, 20% of it is groundwater, probably a little less than 79% in glaciers now because we're losing a lot of glaciers to melt. And this uh, uh, poster is a few years old. Um, so it's a little bit, probably a little bit less than that for ice caps and glaciers. But surface fresh water, all of our rivers and lakes globally, make up only 1% of this little 2.5%. So, so that's a tiny little sliver of water in the world that's actually uh, surface fresh water that we see in our rivers and lakes. So if you take that surface fresh water, that little sliver, and, and expand it out into here, we get 52% of that is in lakes in the world, 38% is soil moisture, just the, the, the moisture that's in the topsoil, not, not groundwater, not, not the stuff that's down that you need to, you know, to, to dig down to get to. Um, but 38% uh, in soil moisture, about 8% of it is up in the atmosphere, is, is water vapor in the atmosphere. And then you've got 1% is in rivers and 1% is within living organisms. So, you know, 1% of this slice of this little 2.5%, those are our rivers, you know, and 52% and of that in lakes. And, and does anybody know how much of the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes? About 20%, about one fifth of the, of the world's fresh water is, is right in our backyard in the Great Lakes. So this is, you know, water is, we, we are not the norm in Wisconsin. I worked, I'm from South Dakota. I worked in Kansas for many years. Anybody know how many natural lakes there are in Kansas? <laughs> Zip, none. Kansas has a couple of wetlands that in, in a good year uh, hold water to almost look like a lake. But all of the lakes in Kansas and Missouri is the same way. I worked in Missouri for a while too, and that's generally the case as you get farther west. Um, they don't have, you know, uh, 15,000 lakes. It's, we, are, we are the oddity. And that's, that's good in some ways and it's bad in others. We tend to take water for granted here. There was, when I worked in Kansas, there's, a, there's a, um, an agency in Kansas, the Kansas Water Authority, whose single job is to work on water quantity issues. That's all they do. Um, we don't have that problem in, in Wisconsin. We have plenty of water quantity. We're starting to worry a little bit more about quality here. Um, most of you remember this from school, the water cycle and, and how water moves uh, through uh, the land and, and the atmosphere. Um, so you get precipitation, you get evapotranspiration coming off plants, uh, you get runoff moving in different directions, you get, you know, you've got groundwater underneath the ground here that's moving mostly in a, in a, in a, with a gravity gradient. Um, evaporation from oceans and lakes, condensation back up in the, in the sky makes clouds. Anybody know what sublimation is? That's always a fun one. Sublimation? If you put a tray of water in the freezer and it freezes and you get ice cubes and you leave them in there for too long and take the tray out, what do you see? You see tiny little ice cubes, right? They've gotten smaller. Sublimation is when water goes from ice to gas. It doesn't it doesn't pass in, through the fluid phase. So sublimation, there's your new word for the day. When your ice cubes evaporate into vapor, that's, uh, that's sublimation. And that happens from, from surface ice on the earth as well. Um, 
So yeah, just a little reminder of, of how water moves and, and, uh, and the fact that it is a cycle and it, and it uh, takes many different forms and is undergoing all kinds of different um, uh, uh, effects from nature and, and other things. So watersheds, um, what is a watershed? Well, sometimes we refer, to, we refer to a watershed as a basin, a river basin. And the word basin, uh, younger people don't understand, but basin used to be a bowl, right? You'd have, you'd have a basin, back in the old days, you'd have a basin and a pitcher of water on your countertop. That was your sink. You know, you'd rinse your hands in this basin. Um, so basically, a, a watershed is, is a basin in nature where you've got, you know, edges of the watershed and everything within that basin, everything within that bowl is draining down into a river or a lake or an ocean um, or maybe just seeping down into groundwater. Um, but that's your watershed. And as soon as you get, you know, you, you would get over this ridge, you'd be in a different watershed. The, 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 the land on the other side of this ridge drains to a different river or to a different lake. So watershed is an, is an area um, that drains to a particular stream, river, or lake. It includes all the surface land area, smaller streams within the watershed. So you can see here, you know, there are smaller streams draining into this larger stream. Down at the bottom, maybe you've got a, you know, you've got a dammed up uh, portion of the river there making a little lake. And then it flows out into some other watershed or some other water body. Um, and watersheds are nested within each other. Small sheds, uh, small watersheds are within larger watersheds. And, and watersheds contain all kinds of things. There's farmland, there's forest, there's urban developments, there's in industry, um, uh, all kinds of things, um, animals. And, it, and the watershed includes the groundwater too. The groundwater underneath the ground is interacting with the surface water. So groundwater is part of that watershed. Um, and this is just a map from over in my neighborhood. Uh, so this is Eau Claire. Um, and this is, the, this is the Lower Chippewa River watershed. Um, so the Lower Chip is right here, flowing down. There's Lake Wissota, flows down through Eau Claire and empties into what? Mississippi, Mississippi River. Um, so these are all the, the little sub-watersheds. These are all the little nested watersheds within the Lower Chippewa. So like for instance over here you've got, uh, this is the headwaters of the South Fork of the Eau Claire River and this is the headwaters of the North Fork of the Eau Claire River. And they come together down here um, and form the Eau Claire River. And there's Lake Eau Claire, which is a, a dammed up flowage on the Eau Claire Lake. And there's Lake Altoona within the city of Altoona. This is Mead Lake over here. Um, I live on the south side of Eau Claire in the Otter Creek watershed. So this is Otter Creek right here. And I'm in this little part of Eau Claire right there that's in the Otter Creek watershed. And next door is Lowe's Creek right there. And if you go over, this way, this is all the Red Cedar River drainage up here. So you've got Hay River over here. Uh, there's the Chatek Lakes and the Chatek River. Um, let's see, this is like 18 Mile Creek by Colfax. So 18 Mile Creek is its own little watershed, but it flows into the Red Cedar River right there by Colfax. And then the Red Cedar eventually flows down here and flows into the Chippewa down south of Menominee. So giving you this idea of watersheds being nested within each other. Every, every stream is flowing to another stream. And we could go into these tiny little watersheds and break it up into more. So here's, here's a tiny little stream within this larger watershed. So that little stream has its own watershed. So you can, you know, you can break it down and keep breaking it down to a, to a micro level. Um, the, the moral of the story is everything here is, is, uh, is draining to this point. Everything here is draining to, well, except for these. These are, these are tributaries of the Mississippi by themselves. I don't know why they're included as part of the lower Chippewa, but that's just how DNR manages their watershed mapping. Um, but, um, so yeah, everything is, is, is reaching this point down here from the, from the watershed and flowing into the Mississippi. And as it flows into the Mississippi, there's, you know, there's the Mississippi drainage. So a much larger watershed that's taking water from all kinds of places, including up into Canada. And there's all kinds of things in the Mississippi watershed. There's urban areas, there's industrial areas, there's all kinds of farmland. In uh, um, uh, Iowa is, is, uh, is mostly all uh, farmland and, and pretty much all of Iowa is draining into the Mississippi. And there's the, you can see the Wisconsin River, which we're very close by. So there's the Wisconsin draining into the Mississippi. And it all goes down here to the Gulf of Mexico. And, and since the, the uh, dawning of industrialization in, in the uh, United States, we have uh, what's called a hypoxic zone or a dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico because all of the, the nutrients and the, um, 
uh, the effluent from oil refineries and chemical plants and other things are all concentrating down here in this <clears throat> portion of the Gulf of Mexico and it's causing an area where there's not enough oxygen for anything to live. So you've got an area that is, depending on the season, about the size of the state of Massachusetts uh, in the Gulf of Mexico where nothing can live. Uh, and it's not, it's not like there's a bunch of dead stuff there, it's just everything moves away from that. You know, the fish will sense that there's no oxygen there and they'll move over to where there's some, some oxygenated water. So that, that's a huge issue and that's, that's a, 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 an environmental issue, it's an economic issue for the, for the fishermen and such down there. Um, and there's an aerial photo of it um, at uh, any given time, like I said, it changes in size. But you can see uh, this area down here where there's, there's the mouth of the Mississippi right there. You can see this area down here is full of sediment and all kinds of other things. There's New Orleans, there's Lake Pontchartrain. Um, and uh, yeah, there's coming down the, the delta, there's all kinds of things coming off the Mississippi River and, uh, and um, causing a, a zone of no oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico. So what we do here affects the Wisconsin River, which affects the Mississippi River, which affects the Gulf of Mexico. Again, this idea that watersheds are nested within each other and connected, and, uh, and the waters, you know, we're sending our problems elsewhere when we send problems downstream. What kind of problems do we have in, in, in water, in water bodies, in rivers and lakes? Uh, usually we divide uh, pollution into two types, non-point sources and point sources. Point sources are usually something that's coming out of the end of a pipe. You can, you can, spot, you can point to the spot and you can say, aha, there is where the pollution is coming from. Um, and actually we've done a really good job. The Clean Water Act, when it was written in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, did a really good job of regulating point sources. If you have a wastewater treatment plant like that, a sewage treatment plant, or if you have a factory, you have a permit that says, we're gonna measure the stuff that's coming out of that pipe and it's gotta meet certain water, water quality standards. If it doesn't, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get fined, you're gonna get arrested, you're gonna get shut down. So, so those plants need to adhere to some pretty stringent regulations and that's because of the Clean Water Act. Non-point sources of pollution where you can't really point to a spot to an end of a pipe, those are a little bit less regulated and we have a lot of issues with, with the pollution coming from non-point sources because of that, because we don't have a lot of uh, regulations um, uh, that are geared toward the stringent control that we have in point sources. So non-point, examples of non-point would be runoff from farms or lawns or golf courses. Um, you know, you might be able to see a little gully and point to a gully, but usually it's just kind of, it's kind of sheet erosion. It's kind of waters moving over that land area and taking with it whatever, whatever is in its path. Uh, urban areas, so you've got rooftops, you know, that are, whatever's on the rooftop is going down the downspout, downspout's going out into the street, going down the storm drain, going right into the lakes and rivers, um, so you've got pollution there. Construction sites, deforested areas, uh, those are producing runoff and, and, uh, and other kinds of, of issues. You've got abandoned mines that, that uh, cause some uh, acid drainage and other things. So these are the types of pollution that, that our water bodies in our watersheds are usually being subjected to. Um, and as I said, we have some regulations to control some of this, but some of it is more voluntary and that makes it kind of problematic sometimes. So how do we know if a watershed is healthy? Well, the obvious thing is, is water quality. You, you look at, the, at the, the quality of the water itself, how much nitrogen, how many nitrates are, uh, uh, what's the quantity of nitrate in that water? What's the, uh, the quantity of uh, phosphorus and phosphorus phosphates in that water. What's the pH? You know, water needs to be, most living critters need a pH around, you know, between seven and eight to survive. If it gets too high, it's too basic, it gets too low, it's too acidic. Most organisms can't survive much outside that seven to eight pH range. Uh, temperature. We don't often talk about, uh, about temperature as a, as a form of pollution or as a type of, of uh, impairment to water quality. But what we call thermal pollution is becoming more of a problem, especially with climate change and urbanization. Uh, I pointed on the map earlier, I pointed to Lowe's Creek, uh, which is just south of Eau Claire. Uh, there's a county park, Lowe's Creek County Park, and Lowe's Creek is a trout stream. And Eau Claire is creeping south a little bit into uh, the Lowe's Creek watershed. Lowe's Creek doesn't have very many trout in it anymore, and the reason for that is because the temperature of Lowe's Creek is going up. Trout need cold water, right? 
as you have more and more urbanized areas, um, uh, you stepped on your, on your bare feet on your driveway when it's a sunny, hot day, right? And you felt that concrete, it gets pretty warm. Streets get pretty warm. Rooftops get pretty warm. Rain hits that, raises the temperature of the water. The water goes down the storm drain, goes out into the creek, raises the temperature of the creek. So we have thermal pollution, temperature issues in water quality. Turbidity, of course, the clarity of the water uh, can tell you whether or not the, the watershed is healthy. Uh, TSS, total suspended solids, is what that means. Uh, that's another measure of, of turbidity. It's a measure of, the, of the, uh, the things that are in the water that are dissolved or floating in the water. Uh, chlorophyll A is a biological measure of basically of algae. So when we test water for its algae content, we're measuring uh, the chlorophyll A that's in the, that's in the algae tissues. Um, so if it's got a high chlorophyll A count, chances are it's, uh, um, it's, being, uh, it's undergoing a, an algae bloom. The critters that live in the water is another way that we assess the health of the watershed. Uh, certain critters are very tolerant of temperature changes or of uh, certain pollutant levels. Other critters aren't. Um, uh, you, you all saw Doug's uh, uh, presentation this morning about insects. He didn't talk too much about insects that live in the water, but there are a lot of insects that live in the water. Dragonfly larvae, before dragonflies are flying around outside, their larvae are in the sediments of our streams and lakes. And they need fairly clean water to exist in those sediments and to exist in those lakes. Mayfly larva, uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, insects whose larva grow and, uh, and have their initial life stage in water. So checking what the, the quantity of those invertebrates, those macroinvertebrates are, are in the water, uh, the, the quantity and the diversity of those critters is another way for us to tell, is that a healthy watershed? Because if you have only a certain number of, in, uh, of invertebrates that are the pollutant tolerant ones, and all the ones that can't tolerate pollutants very well aren't there, chances are you've got a, a water body that's being impaired. Um, fish, you know, d again, trout need cold, clean water. If you don't have cold, clean water, you're not gonna have any trout. Uh, other fish need different, uh, different gradients of temperature and different conditions. Uh, freshwater mussels, uh, again, if you don't have clean water, you're not going to have very many freshwater mussels in your, in your water body because they are, uh, they are not very, they filter the water. You know, that's what mussels do. They take water in and they filter it. So they're going to get all those pollutants accumulating in their tissues. Um, so uh, that's going to be an issue. And other things like crayfish, too. There's, there's other critters in the, in the water that can tell us some things about, uh, about the health of the water and thus the health of the, uh, of the watershed. So this is just a graph. Uh, this is data from DNR. This is just a graph of the Chippewa River at Durand. And this is nitrates over about the last uh, 30 years or so. Is that going in the right direction? No, it's not. This is starting to be a concern um, because nitrates move fairly. You remember that, that map of the watershed, the, the, or the, not the map, but the, the little diagram of the watershed and how water is moving from surface water to groundwater and back and forth. If we're having increased nitrates in our surface water, you can bet that that's happening in the groundwater too. And groundwater nitrates, as Todd Ames was just saying, is becoming more and more of a concern. We have many wells in the state that uh, are no longer, uh, you can no longer drink the water from those wells because of nit nitrate or fecal coliform bacteria uh, uh, pollution or other things. So seeing a trend like this in surface water is only going to mean that Chances are these are the trends in groundwater too. We don't have really good comprehensive measurements of groundwater data because we haven't had a good program in place to measure water quality in groundwater. Uh, most of the groundwater measurements we have are from private, uh, uh, private people who volunteer to test their well water and send that data in. We don't have a good statewide uh, well testing program for private wells. If you're a public water supply, that's different. Like I live in Eau Claire. Eau Claire tests there, you know, they, they pull water from the, from the alluvial, alluvial areas around the Chippewa River north of town, and they test that water for, for different uh, contaminants and stuff. But private well owners don't, do, don't necessarily, there's nothing in place that says they have to do that and report it. They can do that voluntarily, but there's no program in place that makes that mandatory. So we have holes in the data about groundwater within the state. So this is nitrates in the Chippewa. 
this is a graph of, of uh, phosphorus in the Red Cedar River, which is a tributary of the Chippewa. So this is phosphorus, and we see this starting to move in the right direction. We've been doing a lot of work in that watershed. I don't know, you know, I, I started working here in 2008. So look, right when I got here, isn't that amazing? We started decreasing the phosphorus in the, in the Red Cedar. I'll take credit, I'll take credit for it. Um, we don't really know. This isn't a long enough term, a long enough trend yet for us to really know if, if, if this is the things that we're doing to make a difference. Um, I, I'm, I'm starting to believe that it is because a lot of things have changed uh, on the ground there in that watershed in the last 10 years. Um, so we like that trend. We like to see that. So other ways that we measure watershed health. Uh, groundwater. I've talked a lot about groundwater. So this is a, you know, a well, I don't think any, too many people have you know, that kind of well on the top of their, you know, on the surface anymore with the little bucket that goes down, but they, they, they put that in the graph so you know what we're talking about. Okay, so there's the well, right? And there's your well uh, down into the ground and you can see the, the little depression cone where the well is pulling water up. It's gonna, you know, the, the level of the water is gonna drop a little bit right there. The aquifer is pretty deep. Uh, it's per fairly close to the surface. You can see here's groundwater interacting with the stream, interacting with surface water. Um, so again, if something gets in the stream, it's probably going to get in the groundwater, or if something gets in the groundwater, it's probably going to get into the stream, depending on what it is and how well it moves. I said nitrates move pretty readily between surface water and groundwater. That's not so much the case with phosphates, with phosphorus. Phosphorus tends to stay in the soil. It won't, it won't get down into the groundwater as easily as nitrate does, which is a good thing. Um, so we can look at groundwater. Uh, and, and, uh, and use that as a measure of watershed health. Groundwater quality is one of the things that we look at. So is what's, you know, what's the quality of that water? Is it good water? And what kinds of things are we going to test it for? Again, nitrates. If you have 10 parts per million of nitrate in your well water, you shouldn't be drinking it. Even between 5 and 10. If you're above 5, you're already maybe in kind of that sketchy territory, especially if you're a pregnant woman or a baby. Uh, nitrates in water uh, cause blue baby syndrome. Babies can't oxygenate uh, or oxygen can't get into their blood uh, if they have too many nitrates in their system. So nitrates are a concern with private wells. Uh, fecal coliform bacteria, that's an indication that somehow we're getting manure or maybe uh, from septic systems, from human septic systems, uh, getting, into your, getting into your groundwater. So that's something else we test for. Pesticides, you know, you don't want pesticides in your groundwater, obviously. You don't want to be drinking that stuff. Um, arsenic is a naturally occurring element in the earth, and there are places in Wisconsin where arsenic is kind of naturally high. And, you know, you don't want to drink arsenic, right? That's, that's poison stuff. So uh, we want to test our wells for arsenic and see if that's in there. And there, there are other things that, that they test uh, home drinking water for. Um, uh, that aren't necessarily associated with groundwater. Lead is becoming a problem because, as Todd Ames was saying, there are a lot of lead pipes still in the state, uh, even in the, in the country or in, in cities where they're pumping city water through lead pipes. So lead pipe can still, or lead can still get in to drinking water from lead pipes. Groundwater quantity is another thing that we look at, and we usually measure that by depth to groundwater. So if you have a well and you've had to go down 100 feet to get water, and all of a sudden your well dries up and you, you would have to dig your well another 50 feet down to get water. That's an indication that what, that water is being used in a way that's not sustainable. Something is pulling that water table down to the point where it's not up where it used to be for you know, however many years. All of a sudden it's declining. Uh, what's causing that? Chances are too many other wells of one form or another are uh, pulling that groundwater out. Um, so here's a, this is, I was talking about the, the voluntary monitoring program. This is a map of the, the volunteer points. Each of those dots is a private well. And this is not by any means all the private wells in the, in the state. If we could see all the private wells, you wouldn't be able to make anything out on that graph. It would be just full of color. Um, but each one of those little dots represents a well, a private well that some citizens said, okay, we're going to test our water and send in the, the data um, to, uh, the Center for Watershed Science, well, actually DNR, and then, and then uh, the Center for Watershed Science created this graph. Um, my extension colleague 
Kevin Masaryk put all this together. If you've ever, anybody's ever seen one of Kevin's presentations, he's been giving a lot of them around the state lately because of groundwater issues. Uh, Kevin Masaryk is the guy at Stevens Point with Extension uh, to talk to if you have uh, more detailed questions about groundwater. He knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, but you can see by looking at this that there are some trends. We're seeing, you know, here's Kiwani County over here with all of the, the, uh, the issues that they have with karst. Uh, we've got issues down Madison and South, a, a, kind of a splurge over here in St. Croix and, and Polk counties and, and Pierce County. Um, and here's the central sands. You can see a, a stretch right along kind of the Wisconsin River there uh, with some issues. And this is, I'm sorry, this is all nitrate. This is, this is nitrate. So yeah, anything in that orange and red range is where you're starting to get uh, danger. And um, it's interesting, you know, there's, this is North Woods, not much farmland up there, um, uh, sparsely populated, but for some reason, we've got a little, kind of a little explosion of some nitrate issues up there. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that. Um, so anyway, that's uh, just a little snapshot of groundwater stuff. And I talked about groundwater quantity. Here we are in the Central Sands. This is uh, Lake Huron in Washara County. You can see, you know, there used to be a lake up here where these docks are, and the lake is way out here now. And that's because the water table is dropping. And in the Central Sands, um, it's an issue because water percolates down through the ground pretty fast, sandy soil. The water, you know, is not going to stay up on the surface very easily. So the, so the water table is dropping rather drastically as more and more high-capacity wells are pumping water out of it. Um, so that is definitely a major issue that you've probably heard several other people. Todd talked about it in his presentation at lunch. Uh, you've probably heard several other people talking about issues in the central sands or seen it in the news. Um, we definitely are having groundwater issues in Wisconsin that we never used to have. You know, you could stick a straw anywhere in the ground in Wisconsin 50 years ago and get clean water, and that's just not the case anymore. And, uh, and it was usually pretty easily accessible, not very deep. Um, and that's, it's getting, it's getting worse. Um, another way that we measure watershed health is by land cover. Um, natural land cover is going to be, uh, it's going to lend itself to better water quality. In other words, if you have forests, grasslands, wetlands, those kinds of things, um, natural land cover generally means uh, better water quality. This is the Red Cedar River, okay, so, so this is all the Red Cedar here, and again, flowing into the Chippewa, down here, uh, south of Menominee. Um, and the, you probably, you know, I don't know if you can see the, the color coding over there very well. The dark green is forest, uh, orange is pasture land, and yellow is cropland. Uh, and the red is urban areas, and the blue obviously is water. The light blue is wetlands. Um, had you looked at this before European settlement, this would have been mostly green. There was, there's, a, a little, there's some natural grasslands and, and oak savannas down here in this area, but for the most part, this was all forested, you know, several hundred years ago. So we've modified that, and that has changed water quality. We've modified the Red Cedar River. There are several dams, the Shatek Dam, Rice Lake, uh, down here, Tanner and Monoman. All those dams are changing the river. That changes the water quality, changes the hydraulics and the hydrology. Um, so we modify watersheds, and that affects the water quality and the, and the health of the water in the watershed. Um, uh, so again, if you have an abundance of forest, natural grassland, and wetlands in your watershed, chances are you're going to have a pretty healthy, uh, uh, a healthy watershed and healthy water bodies. Um, as an example, if you, uh, if you have like in, a, in an urbanized area, if 25% of your watershed has been urbanized, in other words, on this graph, it's red. So if 25% of this watershed was red, um, uh, let me see if I can point that number. Urban, it's about 6%. 6% is urban. So if 25% of this was urbanized, chances are you'd have the entire uh, watershed streams and lakes would be dead. 25% uh, urbanized or impervious concrete, asphalt, whatever you want, you know, rooftops. 25% impervious cover in a watershed usually means your, your stream and lake will not support life. 15% um, will mean it won't be able to support sensitive things like trout or other, or other sensitive critters. Uh, so in urban watersheds, that's something they have to look out for very closely, is, is how much of the watershed has been uh, turned into impervious surface. If you get 
25% or more, chances are you're not going to have anything living in your, uh, in your um, lakes or streams in that watershed. Uh, ways that we modify and change watersheds. We do a lot. We're, we're humans. We, we, you know, wherever we live, we, live a mark, we leave a mark. We leave a footprint. We change watersheds in many ways. We take out trees. We destroy forests and, um, and thus change. Again, we're changing the hydrology. Trees have big root systems. They suck up a lot of water. They put a lot of that water back in the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. You take the trees out, you're going to change how the water is moving. You're probably going to create more, some more flooding issues because, again, the trees are soaking up the, the tree itself. The, tree, the above ground tree is storing a lot of water, not only in its tissues, but just when it rains, the leaves are all wet. You know, there's a lot of water stored on a tree after a rainfall, and not to mention the, the roots and, and what's in the tree's tissues. So when we go into an area and take trees out, we're changing the hydrology. We're messing things up. We pave, again, impervious surfaces. Nothing can soak through that, right? Nothing's going to soak through that. It's going to be all pushed over to a storm drain somewhere, gathering all kinds of pollutants from the parking lot, and then that all goes out into a, into a lake or stream. Um, uh, developments. Have you had, any of you ever watched... Uh, a, a new housing development go up, what's the first thing they do? They scrape all the topsoil off all the vegetation. Take the trees out first, and then they do that. Then they level it. They make it, they make it level so it's easier to build the houses on. So they're, not only are they de destroying the, the, the ability of the plant life to do what it used to do, because the plant life's not there anymore, the trees are gone. And I always find it humorous that, you know, it used to be a, 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 a pine forest, they take the pines out, and then they call the streets Pine Street. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, maybe once upon a time, but not anymore. Uh, but uh, so yeah, then they level the ground. So they're changing the way the water moves. They're changing what's soaking the water up. And what do we have to do when we when we build developments in that way? We have to put in detention ponds. We have to put in storm sewers. We have to find ways to move that water because it's not moving the way it used to anymore. Um, there are ways to get, there are ways to, to not do it like this. It's called low impact development. If you ever want to look that up, if you're thinking about buying a house or if uh, in your town uh, a new development is going in, push for low impact development. There are ways for developers to not do that, to take out fewer trees, to not level the land. They don't have to do that. They only do that because that's what people have been doing for 100 years. It doesn't have to be done that way. There are other ways to build developments. Um, and then we put up these barriers, you know, once upon a time water flowed across this from one end to the other, but it's not doing that anymore. We've put culverts in or we've put some overpasses over, over some creeks. We've changed how the hydrology is moving uh, in this form of urbanization as well. Um, and uh, you've probably seen in, in the recent major flooding events in Wisconsin how a lot of the culverts that we've installed aren't big enough. You know, we're having these larger rain events and the culverts, culverts are just getting overwhelmed and blowing out the entire, uh, the entire road system where the culvert was. Uh, other ways that we change watersheds. Well, you know, this isn't paving and it's, and it's not housing developments, but this is not natural either. You know, a, a cornfield is not going to behave like a natural grassland. A wheat field is not going to behave like a forest. Um, so when we do this kind of stuff, we're changing how a watershed acts and reacts uh, to rainfall and to runoff. Uh, we put up dikes and levees and things to, to, to keep water in place. And we've seen the futility of this in Nebraska and, and Iowa recently with the, with the nasty weather that they've had there. They've had levees blow out and the, the river wants to expand. If you've ever driven down I-29, I used to do it a lot because I... I would go back and forth from, from where my parents were in South Dakota down to Kansas where I was working. I-29 runs right, right along the Missouri River on the Nebraska-Iowa border. And you can look on either side, you're, you're, you're in flat land on I-29, and if you look east and west, about two miles off in each direction are these bluffs. And that's, that's the natural barrier of the Missouri River's natural historical floodplain. The river wants to spread out four or five miles in every direction when it floods. That's what the Missouri River used to do. The Missouri River is fascinating because it gets two flood pulses. It gets the flood pulse from when the snow melts in the, on the plains in, um, in May, and then it gets another flood pulse when the mountain pack up in Montana and, and Wyoming, where the, where the headwaters are, 
when that melts in June. So the Missouri River historically used to get this, this double, if you look at a hydrograph, it would get this double uh, flood pulse. And we've turned the lower Missouri River into a canal. It's a canal for barge traffic now. So when it wants to flood and the dams can't hold all the water back, it blows those levees out and just wants to spread out onto its floodplain. And, and that floodplain land is prime farmland, so there's all kinds of farms that build right down in that floodplain. And when the Missouri wants to spread out to where it's supposed to, and the same thing with the Mississippi, to a lesser degree, the Mississippi's a little bit more uh, managed in ways that, that won't allow it to flood in certain places. But yeah, so we, we, you know, we modify watersheds that way and nature wants, you know, nature fights against that every chance it gets. <clears throat> Uh, other ways that we modify watersheds, we, you know, we, we take a river and we dam it up. That river normally is flowing, water's moving at a certain pace, the water quality is a certain thing, the, the, um, uh, the living critters in that river are of a certain uh, characteristic. You put a dam up, you stop the river, you're creating a place, basically a little crock pot where you can, where you can cook algae and make algae in that lake. Um, and you're changing the hydrology upstream as well. The river's not gonna flow into the lake the way it used to flow through a moving river. It's gonna slow down farther upstream. It's gonna accrete soil and create more and more um, uh, uh, areas where the lake is filling in after you, after you build that lake with the dam. This is, the, this is a very small dam. This is, uh, size-wise, that railing is about four feet high. This is Mead Lake. This is a dam for Mead Lake in Clark County. Uh, small little dam. You know, there's a larger lake on a, on a mountain river, and there's, or a larger dam rather, and there's the largest dam in the world. That's the, the Three Gorges Dam in China. It was completed a few years ago. Um, that's uh, about a mile and a half long. It's two football fields high. Um, the land behind that, I think they relocated, uh, I can't remember how many millions of people had to be relocated for that. Um, it flooded. Uh, several thousand archaeological sites that were thousands of years old. There are, there are thousand year old pagodas underwater behind this dam in China um, after they flooded uh, the river, after they flooded the valley. Um, so yeah, we, we and, and it, you know, it was necessary. China needs electricity. This is generating all kinds of electricity. Um, and they need water quantity. So this is storing all kinds of water for them. But meanwhile, downstream, you know, China's doing this on a lot of rivers, not to this extent, but, but the, um, the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Mekong River, they all flow through China into other countries. Vietnam is saying, uh, you know, the Mekong is drying up because China is damming it up. The Mekong is, is life in Vietnam. The Mekong River is very important to Vietnam, and China is holding back a lot of the water doing stuff like this. So we're changing water, changing um, hydrology, and it not only affects nature, it affects people and it affects politics and political situations too. Um, how do we measure watershed health in other ways? Soil health is very important. Has anybody seen the, the rainfall simulator up in this picture? A few people have. Yeah, this is really cool. There's, there's, you can't see it up here, but there's a sprinkler up there that goes back and forth. And these are, these are uh, pans of soil about, about that deep that contain different soil types and different plant covers. And um, uh, basically, through a demonstration, you can see how soil that's well care cared for soaks up water really well and water doesn't run off it very easily. Um, and that's what these buckets down here are showing. For instance, you've got uh, some good soil over here with a good, thick, vegetated cover. And very little water, is, this is coming off the little flume here, very little water is flowing into the, into the jug that's, that's, that's coming from runoff. And then there's a jug behind it right there that's got a little bit more water in it, this water that's soaking through. It's, that's what you wanna do. We wanna soak the water into the ground, not run it off. Um, so principally, that's, that's what a lot of my job is trying to get people to infiltrate water rather than run water off, whether that be a farmer or somebody with a house or somebody with lakefront property. That's principally what we're trying to get done. If we can get that done in, in so many ways across Wisconsin, that will fix a lot of our water quality problems. Infiltration, it's all about infiltration. Making water walk rather than run. Um, so that kind of stuff. So soil health is a, is a good indication of what's going on in our watershed. And a good soil has a very high organic content, a lot of organic matter. Um, it has uh, biodiversity. When we, when we till soil up, when we, when we go over soil with a plow 
we're killing everything in it. Those critters are supposed to be underground. When you turn that soil over, they're exposed to the air, they're exposed to the sun, they're dead. That we kill the biota in the soil when we till the soil. Um, uh, water retention, well, again, we want, we want a, a soil type like this, a very, very crumbly, and it's got, uh, I shouldn't say crumbly, it's, it's very porous. It, it actually holds together fairly well, um, but it's very porous and ha has uh, a, a lot of root systems in it and stores a lot of water. Um, soil aggregation, again, one of the tests that soil scientists will show you, good soil versus bad soil, is they'll take a, a glob of soil and put it in a beaker and, and on the, uh, floating on the, on the surface of water and put, it in a, and, and put some bad soil in another beaker and you'll see the bad soil just kind of starts to disintegrate in the water. The good soil stays together, it soaks up that water and just stays together. Um, so that's what we're looking at here is, is soil that aggregates very well. Um, uh, percolation, again, we want water to percolate into that soil. We don't want it collecting on the surface and running off because it's going to take all the pollutants with it and all those pollutants are going to go right down into our stream or our lake. Um, and actually, healthy soil is very good for carbon sequestration. We talk about climate change. Um, if you have a lot of soil organic matter and biodiversity in your soil, your soil is going to be storing a lot more carbon. Uh, as you till that soil up, again, when you till that soil up and the living things in that soil are exposed to the air and they die, all that carbon, goes, that carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. So carbon sequestration is a feature of, of healthy soil. And healthy soil is more fertile. Um, a lot of farmers who, who practice these very um, uh, regenerative ag techniques, very much focused on soil health, uh, will find that they need to use less and less fertilizer. The soil is naturally more fertile because there are more um, uh, organics in the soil. The, basically what, what, what plants are looking for is they're looking for the breakdown products of things that used to be alive, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, other things. If all those living things are still in the soil and living and dying, they're metabolizing, they're creating all that stuff for you. If you keep turning over your soil and keep killing all that stuff, then you have to come over with the fertilizer and you have to add the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium and everything else. So fertility increases in healthy soil. And again, fewer chemicals are needed. Um, uh, less fertilizer is, is always a good thing. And you get reduced erosion. That's, you know, when we're talking about water quality and surface water runoff, we're talking about that runoff carrying all the pollutants into a river or stream and, uh, and we'll re reduce that erosion um, quite significantly if we have good healthy soils. So I'm kind of giving you all these, these uh, background information, all this background information about water quality and how we measure watershed health. What can you folks do about this kind of stuff? Well, if you're a farmer, if you're not, this is the kind of stuff you want your farmers doing. But if you're a farmer, um, practice no-till farming. Again, not tilling the soil. Planting cover crops. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll kind of take these one at a time. Okay, so here's a no-till field, right? Here's last year's corn, last year's corn stalks. And what the farmer's done is planted this year's soybeans right between last year's corn rows. That's no-till planting. He's not tilling up the soil. He's got a, he's got a piece of equipment called a no-till drill that comes by and, and just drills the seeds down into the soil, it's not drill like this, it's, 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 a very, it's a very small little cleaver that opens the soil up, drops the seed in, and then closes the soil. Um, but that's a no-till planter. So you can see that he didn't have to turn the soil over to get his soybeans planted into uh, last year's corn. Um, so that's no-till planting. Cover crops, basically what we want is, is, we're trying to mimic nature. You want farmers to mimic nature as much as you can. If you look at a natural gr grassland, is it ever bare? No. When the stuff dies in the fall, the, 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 the residue from, from that summer's growth is still hanging out there and there's still a root system down in the ground that's alive for many of those perennial plants to come back and grow up again the next spring. So if we get farmers to plant cover crops, in other words, maybe uh, August or so, uh, no, probably earlier than that. I'm not a farmer, so I'm not exactly sure. So when the corn is maybe about knee high, July, I guess, um, the farmer goes out there with, again, with an interseeder, special, special equipment, and plants something like clover or rye grass. And that stuff will pop up through the ground. It won't grow too much because the corn canopy is already, is already blocking out a lot of the sun, but it'll grow a little bit. And then when the farmer takes the corn off 
in, in October or November, you've got this plant that's already there. And it's going to have maybe you know, a couple of weeks to grow a little bit, so it'll grow a little bit. And, and it'll keep a vegetative cover on the land all winter long. And then in the spring, it'll start to green up again. Um, so again, we're keeping vegetative cover on the land year round to minimize the amount of erosion because you're, you're going to get a whole lot more erosion coming off a black dirt field, right? And with all these, these, these major melting events that we had when it warmed up quick after all the snow, um, snow that was lying on these black dirt fields, as soon as that started to melt, it was taking dirt with it. It was taking soil with it. If there was, a, if there was plant residue on top of that soil, and that snow started to melt, the, the, the snow melt would roll off the, the, the land without taking any soil with it because it doesn't have access to the soil. It's, there's a barrier of plant material between the melting snow and the soil. Um, so no-till farming, uh, cover crops, and plant marginal farmland to natural vegetation. Farmers, when corn prices went through the roof, farmers were planting fence row to fence row. Every single little square inch of dirt was going to have a, a corn plant growing on it. Well, some of that shouldn't have had corn planted in it because it wasn't going to it wasn't going to yield anything. It's probably a little too wet. It's probably a wetland. All right, well, if you got a little natural wetland there that's not yielding anything, leave it as a wetland. Let it soak up some water. Let it be what it is. Don't try to make it into farmland if it really can't be farmland. Um, grass waterways, farm uh, especially farms with with a lot of slope will have uh, fields with a lot of slope will have a natural place where wa water wants to gully. So we get farmers to plant grass waterways where those gullies naturally form and, and the grass in those waterways will soak up the water and uh, prevent erosion from happening. So we want grass waterways planted. Um, uh, minimize the use of phosphorus and, and manure applications. In other words, nutrient management. Farms should have nutrient management plans. You folks have probably heard uh, talk about that before when we're talking about managing nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, farmers need nutrient management plans. Uh, so they're only applying the nutrients that the plant needs. They're not putting more manure or more nitrogen onto their field than the plant can actually make use of because that extra is just going to be, it's going to run off with the, with, the, uh, with the rainfall runoff. Keep livestock away from streams and rivers, of course. We don't want the cows pooping in, in, the, in the rivers and lakes. Um, so other things you can do if you're not a farmer, if you have a septic system, Make sure it's working right. Make sure it's been inspected. Make sure it's, it's up to code. Um, uh, because as I said, you know, leaping, leaking septic systems, nitrogen, nitrates can move pretty easily from groundwater into surface water. Uh, you want your septic system to be working properly. Uh, use phosphorus-free products, fertilizers, dishwasher detergent, laundry detergent. You can get all that stuff without phosphates in it. Um, you don't need phosphates to clean your clothes. I don't use phosphates in my, and, and they, they smell good. They smell good. Um, so uh, you don't need to, to buy the phosphate stuff. You can buy phosphate-free detergents. Um, uh, don't dump pollutants or other liquids down storm drains. Most of you know that. Storm drains go directly. You'd be surprised how many people still don't know where storm drains go. Some people think they go to some treatment plant somewhere. No, storm drains are just a conveyance to a lake or a river. Um, I, I often tell people if you've got a storm drain out, out in your front yard in, in your city, you, congratulations, you have riverfront property um, because that's, that's where your water is going. Uh, so make sure whatever you're putting in your yard or on your driveway or out on your boulevard, you know, pets, pet waste, all that kind of stuff, um, make sure uh, that that's not going into the storm drain. Um, and construction sites too. I, you don't have to drive around too much to find a construction site that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. You can see what's, ha what's happening here, you know. You can see the gullies on this pile of dirt. All that is washing off here. It's gone right down into a street, right down into the storm drain. That soil contains nitrogen and phosphorus. It's all being washed right into the creek uh, via the storm drain. So construction sites need to be up to code. Other things that you can do, and there have been a lot of, you know, every time you come to the Lakes Conference, if, if you've been here before, there's talks about this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, network and partner with other individuals or groups who may be working on water-related issues and events. Uh, you're going to be stronger as partners with a unified voice, and you're going to be able to, to share each other's resources and share each other's ideas if you, if you partner up. Um, talk to your local and state government officials about uh, the need for um, uh, laws and regulations to lead towards the things that you want. I can't stress this enough. I've talked to enough legislators where they'll, they'll, they'll say, 
I, I didn't hear it from anybody about this. Nobody contacted me. If you want, the legislature is not going to listen to the same news story that you see about water quality issues unless somebody brings it to their attention. And the people that they're listening to most are the people that are paid a lot of money to knock on their door every single day and advocate for whatever it is that they're advocating for. So if you want a legislator to pay attention to your issues, talk to them. Don't send them an email, don't sign a petition. Talk Well, I mean, you can do that stuff, but your most effective means is to talk to them. Build a relationship with them or their staff, get to know them, talk to them. They wanna hear this stuff. Um, talk to your family and friends about the things that you learned. Share this knowledge. When you leave the Lakes Conference, talk to people that weren't here and say, hey, well, guess what I learned at the Lakes Conference this year? You know, this stuff is very good. Participate in cleanups. Uh, other events um, that, uh, that keep the environment and our lakes and rivers clean and sustainable, all that stuff is important. Um, rain gardens, you heard um, uh, Doug talking about uh, insects. Rain gardens are great for insects. Where your downspouts come down, you know, rather than that water being squirted right out into the street, put a rain garden down at the end of your downspout. If you want to know more about rain gardens, there's tons of stuff online, or you can, you can call me, I'll give you my contact information, I can talk to you about rain gardens. Um, Businesses and cities and others can, can, you know, a parking lot. What's wrong, you know, Walmart can afford to take, you know, a couple dozen parking spaces and turn them into little vegetated islands that soak up water. You know, it really wouldn't hurt them that much to do this. Uh, I wish more of them would, but here's an example of, you know, a parking lot with some little, there's a curb cut right there where the water comes in from the, from the parking lot and waters these plants, great. You, you're building pollinator habitat and you're soaking up water, just exactly what we need. And for lakefront property owners, you guys know this, N none of that. <laughs> we don't want golf courses next to lakes. That's, that's not what we need. We want this, that, that multi-story vegetation where you've got vegetation out in the water, you've got short vegetation here, you've got taller vegetation behind it. All that stuff is stabilizing your shoreline. It's preventing runoff. It's doing what it's supposed to do. You know, when I was a kid, lake cabins were that. They were lake cabins and they were back in the woods. You, you drive around on the lake, and, oh, there's, yeah, I think there's a little cabin back there behind the trees. Now it's like, ah, you know, you drive by and there's this huge, huge monstrous house with spotlights shining on it. And it's like, mm, no, that's not good. Um, so yeah, other things, uh, you know, conserve water wherever possible. Most of you know this, turn the tap off when you're brushing your teeth, low flow shower heads and flush toilets, stuff like that, um, nothing new. Pick up trash, you know, plastic is getting into everything. Plastic is being found in the bellies of birds and in the bellies of fish and in the bellies of whales. Um, every time I see a just a little piece of plastic lying around, I, I, I try to pick it up if, if, I'm, uh, if I spot it and I'm um, uh, close to some place where I know I can put it in the garbage can. Uh, so do those kinds of things if you can. Buy a reusable, re reusable water bottle. Don't buy bottled water. Bottled water, is, it's, the, it's, it's very bad. <laughs> Most of the plastic that's floating around in the ocean is bottles. Um, so we need to stop that. Um, don't run your dishwasher, clothes washer, unless it's full, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can buy smart appliances that use less water. Um, water's life. We need it. We need to keep it clean. We need it for everybody. And healthy watersheds means clean water. So that's all I have for you. And we have time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, are those watershed maps online somewhere, or where is that? Uh, go to DNR's website and uh, look up surface surface water data viewer. That's uh, uh, you can look at maps of watersheds. Um, I don't know if they have them down. Those were HUC twelve. That's the, the code HUC hydrologic unit code. Is the, is the coding for watersheds. Those were, on that map that I showed, those were HUC 12 watersheds, those are the smallest. I'm not sure if DNR has those smaller watersheds, but they've got the slightly larger ones, um, uh, like the Red Cedar River would be a watershed and so on and so forth. Anything else? All right, thank you.